That was the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we look at the vessel, we look at the person, and we think, well, where did she get that from? Or where did he get that from? Holy Spirit spoke to you this morning. It's only when you carve yourself out with your own self-centered agenda and path of life that the enemy can devour you. It's a terrible thing to fall in the hands of the living God. The Bible says, woe to those who have tasted of the Lord and then return to the vomit of this world. So that was powerful. And today, many things will be touched upon in that particular uh, revelation. Grace and peace be with you all. Christ is risen. This is the seventh Sunday after Easter. Tick. Your life is passing by quickly. Christ is risen. Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that the Son may glorify thee, since thou hast given him power over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom thou hast given him. The Bible doesn't say he gives eternal life to those who have received him. It says he gives eternal life to those the Father gave him. Turn to somebody and say, God the Father gave me to Jesus. We have a hard time with gifts because they don't require strength, power, and ability. We like that as humans, don't we? We like to think our strength, power, and ability gets us something but it does not get you your eternal life because you are a gift from the Father to Christ himself. And this is eternal life. What is eternal life? That you don't go to hell? That's not eternal life. This is eternal life that they know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I glorified thee on the earth, having accomplished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, Father, glorify thou me in thy own presence with the glory which I had with thee before the world was made. Do you know each one of us had a glory with God before we ever got a body? And this church, St. Isaac's, had a glory in God as a community before we ever were born. You're here today because this is what glorifies God, to know the Father and the Son and to be a part of his body. I have manifested thy name to the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. Now they know that everything that has given me is from thee. In other words, everything that I have, Jesus is saying, Father, you gave it to me. And if we're Christ, we should say, everything I have, Father, you gave to me. Because we are one with him. Listen to this. That marriage you're struggling in, God gave you that spouse. That's your assignment from eternity. That friend or that sibling that annoys you and drives you crazy, God gave you that person. For his glory. For his glory. Not for your benefit. The bishop God gave you. God gave you. For his glory. Not to motivate you into having a fixed and better life. But that you would know the Father. And whom the Father sent. In spite of your circumstances. I'm not trying to preach right now, but you need to hear what Jesus is saying here. Now they know that everything that thou hast given me is from you. For I have given them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you did send me. How many of you believe that Jesus was sent to you by the Father? You did not choose Jesus. 
Nobody here chose Jesus. He chose you. I am praying for them. Now, this is the high priestly prayer. This is Jesus praying as the high priest of his body. I'm not praying for the world. Jesus said, I'm not praying for people to get saved. I'm praying for the ones you gave me. Tell two people Jesus is praying for us even right now. What's he praying for? He's praying that you can hear truth and know truth. Not be entertained. You are addicted to entertainment. And entertainment is not empowerment. To know the one true God is power and eternal life. Help me, Jesus. He says, I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom thou hast given me, for they are, they are yours, Father. They belong to you. All mine are yours, and all that are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Father. Holy Father, keep them in thy name, which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Sunday morning is astounding to me. I watch as people come. And I watch the time it takes for them to get out of the car to come into community. And I'm asking myself, why would I get somewhere and not engage quickly into the setting up of the sacred meal? We stop, we talk, we stop in the hall, we do all this stuff. But it's still about what I want to do. It's not about here I am engaging again in the flow. See, this whole thing is about being in a flow. Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. Let the rivers flow. See, flow means movement. So today... I'm not rebuking anybody. I'm asking you to do an assessment of yourself. Am I faking community? Or am I really pursuing community? Or am I just meeting an obligation to say I was there? So that Bishop doesn't start inquiring about my absence. <laughs> but he gave you to me to be a father. If I wasn't concerned about your absence, I wouldn't be worthy to be a father. Amen. None of you are going to be happy if dinner is set at home and two of your kids have not showed up for an hour. This world is contaminating the minds of the next generation. We must be set free. This is the word of the Lord. Happy are they who hear these words, believe them, and obey them. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Heavenly Father, help us today to be enlightened, empowered, have our minds opened up out of the pattern of our carnality. Break the habitual pattern of our carnality that you may crack us, Lord, and let the light shine into the darkness. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Grace and peace, everyone. It's vacation time. We all get a break. But you can't take a vacation from God. See, carnality is motivated by fear. Spirituality is motivated by love. If you're in the spirit, you're motivated by love. If you're being carnally minded, you're motivated by fear. What are your fears? 
It's a sign. When fear pops up, it's a sign that you're being motivated by a carnal motivation. What are you afraid of? Let me see that scripture you read today. See, it's contrary to the mind to say that blessed are you, rejoice, when the fiery ordeal is taking place among you. Not you, among you. Your fiery ordeal is supposed to be happening among us. Well, I don't want people in the church in my business. That's why the enemy has put fear in you. Your personal business can only be healed in community. It says that glory is revealed through the endurance of trial. Glory is not revealed through the escape of a trial. A mentor calls his protege deeper into the problem, not from the problem. We try to get our kids out of the pain of the problem when we need to teach them to discover the glory of God in the problem. It's time to dive into the river of mystery. And be in the flow. See, Jesus was not an independent agent. He was in the flow with the Father and the Holy Spirit. We see it right here. We see that he says, I'm only doing what glorifies the Father. And what you do glorifies me. And the Holy Spirit helps comfort us all in the glorification process. So there's a difference between a river that is flowing. And most of us, you can't flow in the river if you're an independent agent of the Spirit. Because the river is the life of the Trinity and the church. People are trying to find, this is why there's no joy in the church. Because they're trying to battle their problems in an independent spirituality. Rather than having someone to talk to on a regular basis about their progress in overcoming the problem. And like I said at the beginning, the enemy wants to carve you out of the flock and take you and say, come here, I want to show you a greener pasture over here. I want to show you a better life. That Christian life is boring, repetitious. Come over here where there's some excitement and some fun and some happiness. Jesus was not an independent agent of the Spirit. He never brought any attention to his own spirituality. He said, all you've given me, I'm given them. And all that I've given them, they will give to others. It's time to jump in the mystical river. Huh? Jesus does not see himself as an independent agent, but we see ourselves as independent agents of the Spirit. We interpret the Bible for ourselves. We listen to preachers to find a message that justifies our greed and our idolatry and our hedonism and our and our need for attention. We look for scriptures that build our self-esteem rather than scriptures that empower us to a true destiny. And 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 we've allowed religion to develop because most people today are going to church this Sunday to worship Jesus but not imitate him. Thank you very much, Stan. We'll pray and leave now. Most people have come to worship God, but not imitate Him. They have come to praise Him, hoping that their praise will get them something, rather than imitate Him to be someone. He did not come. He came to finish the work that He was sent to do by the Father. Are you finishing somebody's work other than your own? Whose work are you trying to finish? This is the true gospel here. I mean, you know, we we like the gospel that gets us excited and motivated. You know, next this week we have one, two. I can tell you because I'm the bishop and I know my flock. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, twelve, twelve people not here. I know where seven of them are. The other five have their own agenda. (laughs) That doesn't mean I don't love them. That doesn't mean I don't pray for them. But I watch them still have the same problems over and over and over. 
You can't keep doing the same thing and expect things to change. So the only way you can change is submit yourself to something bigger than you. To the flow of God that's bigger than your flow. I, I can't preach messages. You know, somebody said, well, we were talking, I was talking with Deacon. Last week we had a guest here, and everybody's like, well, did they enjoy it? I don't care. <laughs> I'm not trying to win people in the service. Like, I liked it, I didn't like it. I don't like going to get my teeth cleaned. <laughs> did you like it? Well, I have to do it. But see, we still have it in our minds that we're going to attract people by our presentation. And so then we fall, in, fall into the seduction of altering the presentation to make something attractive. And then we have to abandon the raw core truth in order to attract. And then now we have to continue to motivate people with something that's not full truth. And then eventually they wonder, why is this such a hard message? It's because we attracted you with something you liked rather than something you need. And then, you know, we walk, and then, then what happens is when it's time for us to be weaned off of <laughs> the things that excite us and we like and become faithful in spite of whether we still like it or we're going through a fire or ordeal, we find out really how sincere we are or that we were, whether we were just parrots faking it. Hmm? When I first started preaching, we were started in a hotel that doesn't exist anymore. It's called the Capri Motor Hotel at 80th and I-25. We would share the basement with psychic people and chinchilla con conventions and stuff. And I mean, it was unbelievable. You go down there, you could smell chinchillas. And, and we were just starting to build the church. And there was a family that was wanting to come to the church. But I promised my pastor, I'm not going to invite people to church if they come then that's their decision. Well, this family was coming. They called, well, we're going to be in church tomorrow. And I had this typical Bishop Gregory message that just, you know, either fall on the rock or the rock's going to fall on you message. <laughs> you know, it's not like exciting. And I got up. The only time I've ever done this in my life, and I'm confessing it to you, I got up and I changed the message because I knew they were coming and I wanted them to become a part of the church. I went home and mowed my lawn and cried all afternoon. I felt, mother will tell you, I felt so sick, I got sick to my stomach. And God says, I don't need your help in calling the people I've chosen. You preach the word I've given you, and the ones that I've called to hear it will hear it, and the ones that are not won't. And I made God a vow that day. I'll never candy up the message for people who are visiting again. Because a visitor is nothing more than a visitor. There's somebody here today and gone tomorrow, but I intend on you burying me or me burying you, one or the other. That's what family is. How goofy we are. We try to motivate our kids. You know, we give them an allowance for being good. We pay them for doing what they should do. Makes no sense. Huh? The COCOA, how many of you know what the COCO, the Christian Orthodox Church of America, is about? Do you really even know what it's about? It's an alternative orthodoxy. It's an alternative orthodoxy. It is not mainline orthodoxy. That doesn't mean we don't respect mainline orthodoxy, but let's just get it straight once and for all what we're about so that when you come here, you understand what you're involved in. We offer, uh, we all offer an alternative orthodoxy or heteroorthodoxy, which is a third dimension, another dimension. We are not mainstream. We don't throw out the mainline traditions of other churches. We simply place our effort and our energy on overlooked, and misunderstood aspects of holy tradition. We investigate overlooked things that have just become a part of assumed mainline, which is transformation. Transformational theology. That does not make us heretics. Are you following me? That does not make us heretical. So 
rather than question dogma and doctrine, we are in the state of discovery of what it means to be Christ in the earth. We're in the state of discovery. Amen? So, imitation of Christ we take very seriously. We don't take believing in Christ that seriously. We take imitating Christ very seriously. In other words, live the way Jesus lived. Not attend church, worship him, and then go live the way I want to live. That is what you call hypocrisy. Worship him, but go live the way I want to live. Because I'm afraid that that horse I'm riding is going to lead me down a path I won't be comfortable with. I just want to go down a path. I have insurance that I'll like the destiny if I get there. That's the only path I want to go down. Amen? You only know, this is what St. Francis of Assisi, and St. Francis of Assisi, actually, the Franciscans believe this, what I'm saying right now, which is orthopraxy over orthodoxy, to practice orthodoxy rather than to hear it. Maybe we should change our name from the Christian Orthodox Church of America to the Christian Orthoproxy Church of America because we're practicing, not just hearing. We're practicing. Amen? Emphasis on action, practice, and lifestyle, lifestyle is more important than on belief systems. The Pharisees believed the right system, but did not practice the kingdom. Are you here? So we are learning to fall in love with the humanity and the humility of Jesus. He was very man of very man, very God of very God. You have to fall in love with Jesus' humanity as well as his humility. That's what it is to live like him. Are you all here today? Jesus is someone to actually initiate and not just to worship or to imitate, not just to worship as a divine being. Imitation is what it's about. So we can be alternative and still be called orthodox, right or true. Are you following me? So the creative and the courageous prophets of old, they believed that the medium or the messenger had to be the message, not say the message. In other words, we are living epistles being read of men. We are being read. Our life is being read. What people are reading is not whether we believe we're going to heaven or hell. They're reading on how we deal with a fiery trial. Do we quit being faithful when life gets hard? Do we quit being faithful when life isn't convenient anymore? The message that's being read, the medium, the messenger, and the message have to be the same thing. And St. Francis of Assisi also said, we've quoted this hundreds of times, preach the gospel at all times when necessary use words. We should stop using words to preach, and our life should be something that is preaching. We are the message. Amen? Not the message like you think the message. Like, if you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? If that is your concern, you are not yet matured in the Spirit. The concern should be, am I the medium of the message? Am I the one living the message? Because they have to be the same thing. We must emphasize this aspect of our true spirituality. So we are gospel practitioners. How many of you know what a practitioner is? We are a royal priesthood. Another word for royal priesthood is we're gospel practitioners. We're practicing the gospel. Like a medical practitioner practices medicine. We are gospel practitioners. And we're being trained in the kingdom. We're coming to worship today, but we're being trained that we're not merely word police or inspectors of other people's fruit. 
You know, you've heard that message before, be a fruit inspector. No, be a message. It's not your job to inspect somebody else's fruit or be a word policeman. (laughs) Well, my Bible says, well, I don't care what your Bible says. What does your life say? Your Bible says a lot of stuff. The question is, is your life reflective of what the Word says? Time to get in the flow. Huh? But you know what we do when we're seduced away by the, fire, by the enemy who's roaring looking for us? He seduces us into compromising the message that we're supposed to be living and justify it with, I have a unique situation. It's complicated. My new, unique situation... In other words, my individual flow can be contrary to the corporate flow because I'm special. And my circumstance is special. Yet I will preach God is no respecter of persons. See, we can change the city of Denver. Right here, the people in this room have the power to change the whole city in the spirit. By a unified flow. And those watching over the web right now. See, you've been mistaught what salvation is. You've been taught that salvation is a consequence of your behavior rather than a continuance of your behavior. And we come to this sacred place to be fueled with life, to be fueled with divine life by God. We come to be formed for life, which is called forma vitae in the Latin, which means orthopraxy is correct practice and is necessary, whereas orthodoxy is correct verbiage. Correct words versus correct practice. You're not saved by your words. You're saved by the gift of God to practice what you were saved to. I said last week we're all saved in that tub corporately we're corporately saved that's hard for an ego driven spiritual mind to say my efforts it humiliates ego because I want my efforts to gain me advantage so I can control other people I'm about done I'm not going to preach long today this is kind of a heavy message are you here The river of mystery, staying in the flow of God's grace. Notice in the scripture that Deaconess read today, it talked about God's grace. So the question is that the prophets would always ask Israel, or they would always ask them, why aren't you living what you believe? Why aren't you living what you say you believe? No weapon formed against me can prosper. Then why are you living as though a weapon can be prospered? All things are working together to good for the call. According, Then why are you living as though all things are not working together for good? Why aren't you living what you say you believe? Because you're carved out trying to live it on your own and not in the life of the community. Why are you not living what you say you believe? The real life is not about you. (laughs) It's about being a part of the stream that Jesus was in with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Our connection. I'm about done. Are you all still with me here? Let me tell you about the grace of God. I'm going to tell you something about the grace of God that is going to help you overcome your fears. Whatever they are. First, you need to ask yourself, what is your fear? I was talking to some guys the other day, well, my fear of being alone. If you're afraid of being alone, you will manipulate other people to stay with you. This is why people are in bad marriages. They were afraid to be alone. But if I believe he will never leave me or forsake me, I'm never alone. And so my... My, the presence of God in my life and my community is all I need 
in the flow of grace. Grace and mercy teach us that we all are much more than the good or bad stories we tell about ourselves. We're more than that. So we have self-made identities that are based on our hurts and our unconscious agendas for self-gain that allow us to see and judge things in a very selective way. So we judge selectively because our, self, our self-composed or self-identity package that we put together accommodates our fears and hurts rather than the message of God. And that's what we call personality. Personality. Because we use our personality, whether we use it in boldness and aggression or in pity and feeling sorry for ourselves, we use it to support a self-made identity rather than the identity of Christ. Okay, now I'm, not, I'm losing you. Tell me, Bishop, you're not losing me. Bishop, I won't let you lose me. The spirit described as flowing water. The spirit is described as flowing water, as a spring inside of you, the river of life. Next week we celebrate Pentecost. Notice when they were praying in the upper room, they were all together praying together. People weren't going to their houses saying, well, go home and pray for me. They were saying, we're praying together. Well, my prayers don't get answered. Duh. Duh. I wonder why my prayers aren't getting answered. Because God can't hear your prayers. He hears our prayers. So, say that, say that she's going through something, and she's praying for God to deliver. God can only hear where two or more are praying. So until I get involved in what she's praying to God for, God can't hear her prayer. Confess your weaknesses one another and pray for one another that you may be whole. But no, I've been praying that God would prosper my finances. See, here's where we ought to be. Pray for me. I'm going through a fire trial. Good. You have a chance to glorify God. Now you get to glorify God. Now you can use the grace of God for glorification and not the grace of God for relief. Now you get to use the glory of God to fill the void. The grace of God fills the void rather than gives you a band-aid in your process. Huh? This is how mystics think. Faith is trusting the big river of God's providential love. We trust the visible embodiment, the church, which is the Son in His body. We trust the flow of the Holy Spirit and the source of itself, the Father. So we trust the source, the flow, and the embodiment together. This is the divine process, beloved, that we don't have to change, coerce, or improve. We just need to allow it to happen and enjoy it. That it takes immense confidence. Say it takes confidence to trust God when I'm hurting. It takes trust and confidence to trust God when I'm hurting. That's when I'm preaching the message. And that's when God's being glorified. So we are partakers of his sufferings because suffering is an opportunity for the grace of God to empower us to bring glory to him in something that humanity is resisting. Okay, I'm going to finish up. I'm telling you how to get out of fear. Don't be afraid of the process of a fiery trial, but rejoice in the process of a fiery trial because it's the opportunity to access the grace, which is God's strength beyond your own ability to bring glory to God. We, 
The grace of God has appeared to all men that they may say no to ungodliness. So my, my message to you today, in my first conclusion, you're going to love this. Don't panic. <laughs> Tell two people, don't panic. The problem is when you face a trial, you panic. And you try to fix it by doing something quickly. You say, i got to get this straightened out right away because I'm panicking at the fiery trial, but never panic at the fiery tribal. Tell two people, don't panic when the fiery trial comes. Because I promise you, you're going to panic, and then you're going to get better than what you wanted in the first place. Don't panic. (laughs) Say it right now, I, I, I renounce panicking. I'm going to shut down the panic room. That's what most churches are. They're panic rooms. Well, here's all my problems. Pray for me. Uh, Rather than come in, hey, I'm in a fiery trial. Praise God. I'm about to glorify God in my fiery trial. Hey, poverty isn't a state of finances. Poverty is a state of mind. I'm having my mind changed so I can prosper now. Now, you know why I don't get invited places to preach, but I ain't called to preach to them. Don't panic. Have you ever felt yourself getting panicky? That's why cast your fears upon him when anxiety comes. She just read it. When anxiety comes, it's because you're panicking. Turn to somebody and say this. I quote, This too shall pass. (laughs) See, practitioners of the gospel tell people in a fiery trial to stop panicking. The Holy Spirit doesn't have more power because you're panicking. Praying in tongues at the, top of your, at the top of your lungs to get him to do something. Hey, there's nothing wrong with praying in tongues. The Bible says he that prays in a tongue prays mysteries to God. Not get solutions. Uh, he that prays in the tongue gets in the river of mystery. And it's saying, even though everything around me, even though my enemies encamp about me, I will be at peace. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Lord, you are with me. You make me lie down by rivers of living. Don't panic. Why are you panicking over something that has not yet happened? And if it does happen, don't panic. Because all things are working together to good. Maybe he's got to take you off of a throne you've put yourself on in order to get the grace activated in your life. And that's what Mary said, to throw them off their throne. The job of the Holy Spirit is to throw you off your throne and let you be enthroned with God. Are you here? The river of mystery. So, what happens is when I start to panic, I ignore my body and heart in exchange for obsessing. I start obsessing. When I obsess, I imagine. When I imagine, I create fear. I give the devil a platform for fear to intimidate me. But we've not been given a spirit of fear. Oh, I've got to finish. I'm trying to, I'm trying to conclude this thing here. See, this is why you can't miss the Eucharist. If you're forsaking the body and blood of Jesus, I don't care how many books you read, sermons you listen to, you get one of my tapes played 150 times. Cycle it all night long and you're sleeping and everything. If you don't have life in you, you're going to continually gravitate to carnality. Are you here? So Simon Wheel said, he was a philosopher, listen to this. Fasten your seatbelts, I'm finishing. I'm going to tell you something you've never probably heard before. I hadn't heard it before until I read this, so I'm sharing it with you. 
Grace fills empty spaces, but it can only enter where there is a void to receive it. Grace fills empty places, so it can only enter where there's a void. So you, when you have a void, you'll either try to fill it with God's grace or something else. Right? So God's grace not only is looking for a void. This is for you, deaconess. He's creating a void so he can fill you with his grace. So God's love is so great, he'll create an empty space in you so he can fill it with his grace. So the concept of grace is that I'm going to have times that I feel voids. Especially in the necessary parts of life. Can I finish this part? And it is grace itself which makes this void. Grace creates the void so that God, through his love, can fill the grace, the void with his grace. Grace leads us to a state of emptiness. You think God's grace leads you to a state of power. God's grace leads us to a state of emptiness. No matter how much I make, no matter how much I I think I'm loved, there's still something missing. Because only God's grace can fill the void. So God creates voids to fill us with his grace. That's his love. Are you here? So, grace leads us to the state of emptiness, to the momentary sense of meaningless in which we ask ourselves, what is all of this for anyway? When you say that, that's the work of grace working. What does it all mean? All we can do is try to keep our hands cupped open, and it is even grace to do that. But we must want grace and know we need grace. Ask yourself, what am I afraid of? Does it matter? Will it matter at the end or in the great scheme of things? Is it worth holding on to? Some of us are holding on to things that are obsolete to the purpose of God for our lives. Like I said, when I walked in there today, I saw all the walls down, all the metal down. The Lord told me something. He said, rejoice. Rejoice. You built it so I could use it for a while to show you what I don't want you to be. I had to, I had to create an emptiness to fill you with a grace. But what, most of us, we want God to solve our problems or give us what we think we need. And then we become religious hypocrites. Grace will lead us to such fears and emptiness, and grace alone can fill them up if we are willing to stay in the void. (laughs) Look, I'm going to say it's going to make no sense to you mentally, but I know what this is. I have discovered what this is. You have to stay in the void. Don't try to escape it. So the grace can come and fill it there. You know, we read the book Shattered Dreams. God shatters dreams to create the void. you got to stay in the void. Not try to self-design your way out. Are you here? There's nothing going on in any of your lives, not one of your lives. There's nothing that's going on that God didn't create that void for you to receive his grace. For his grace is sufficient The apostle said, Lord, take this thorn from me. He says, I asked the Lord three times. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Quit trying to fix the void. Let them stay in the void. So my grace is sufficient, not the escaping of the void.
God doesn't love the Israelites, anybody else, or even us today because we are good. God loves us from a free and deliberate choice to love us. We are made for one another from the beginning. We're made for one another from the beginning, Ephesians 1, 4, 6 says. Maybe the ultimate grace is to know that it is all grace to begin with. It is already a grace to recognize that it is grace. It's a grace to recognize it's all grace. Amen. So, receiving God's love has never been a worthiness contest. This is for you. I'm worthy of God's love. No, you're not. God doesn't love you because you're worthy. If you think you're getting love from God because you're worthy, then you're going to let your ego perform for God. And you're not going to understand how to stay in the void. <laughs> Am I t- is this too deep, Father? Is, it, is this too deep? Why, y'all are looking for relief from something God put there so he could fill you with his grace. So he can be glorified. Look what he did to Jesus. Look what it, have y'all seen the movie The Shack? See it. It's in, on Netflix. It's free now. Watch it. He, how can a loving God allow his son to be mutilated? Because I had to create a void for myself and stay in it. In order for love to come. <laughs> the proud will seldom submit until they are brought down from their thrones. How many of you have had an event in your life? If you haven't had one, you will. Have had an event in your life that devastated you or somebody you're close to caused by you. Sometimes, because we won't submit to God, he's got to let us be devastated in order to create the void to really reveal his grace of how much we need him. As Mary put it, they are brought down from their thrones. It just does not compute inside our binary, judging, competing, and comparing brains. Look, just because a person can get an education does not mean they're wise. Wisdom does not come from education. Wisdom comes from the experience of God in a void state. Stand to your feet this morning. (laughs) This community is called to orthopraxy more so than orthodoxy. It is not called the verbal articulation of the kingdom. It is called to actual practice of the gospel. How do I practice the gospel? I just told you how to practice. Not go out and buy somebody a, 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 you know, a happy meal and say God loves you. That's not practicing the gospel. Practicing the gospel is living in the void and being glorified, letting God be glorified through the process. That's what speaks to people looking for God. God does not love you because you are good. God loves you because God is good. And then you can be good because you draw upon the infinite source. Everybody say infinite source. The implanted desire. Inside of you, there is a little God looking for more of him. Inside of you, there's a little bit of God looking for more of God. It's called the infinite source. You can start playing the music. Listen to this. Grace is the concept of election and chosenness, not the grace of acceptance. I am chosen of God. For God to damn me, he would have to reject what he chose. If he is love, and love does not reject, God wants to redeem everything So the church will be spiritually mature when it's no longer preaching the consequence of heaven or hell. But it's preaching the kingdom on earth. That's when the church is mature. It does not have to use fear tactics of those who are carnally in pursuit of relief. 
but it uses spirit tactics of love. Are you here? I'm finishing. When we see the message of implanted grace most clearly in Jesus, he recognizes that he is one with God. Do you recognize you're one with God? Jesus knows that it is God in him doing and the knowing, loving, and the serving. Do you know, believe that it's God in you doing the knowing, the loving, and the serving? Jesus fully trusts his deepest identity and never doubts it. Do you doubt your identity in Christ? And are you seduced to go back to an earthly or a secular identity in order to be accepted and recognized? We often doubt, deny, and project our true identity, finding it hard to believe that we did not choose or create ourselves. Bow your heads, beloved. What are you afraid of? What's your greatest fear? God's loving kindness, his grace, his mercy is constantly creating voids in your carnality so he can fill you with his divinity, which is called the grace of God. I pray for your people, Lord. You gave them to me. <laughs> you gave them to the COCOA. And now I have taught them your word, Father. I have given them your word that they may glorify you. I have confidence, Lord. There's not a doubt in my mind that you chose us and you chose me to be the voice to give them your word that they may bring glory to you. And any demon or any force that tries to deny that, I reject it and stand in the void where the grace abounds. I bless you all in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tell two people quickly, whisper it loudly. Don't panic. We believe in one God. Don't panic. And all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all ages, light of the